I brought Krista Coleman, Chief Customer Officer for K-12 Insight to tell you how did she reduce her churn rate in half within less than 12 months. Absolutely amazing work. And she's not done yet. She just started there a year ago. So I brought her in today to share all her insights on what works and what doesn't. I think you're going to be really surprised around some of the things she did and the in-depth framework that she has established there to really uproot the causes for churn. Because a lot of times we see companies just have different playbooks. The executive left, this is what we're going to do. Well, I think it's really about treating the symptoms when you have those playbooks. Today, Krista is going to show you how to uproot those all together. Before we start, I'd like to remind everyone, subscribe to our YouTube channel for all the great videos that we produce on customer success. Krista, thank you so much for taking the time to share your insights and what you've done and how did you accomplish this amazing feat? Hello, and first of all, Yuri, thank you for having me. It has been an amazing feat. I did have a little help throughout my career, 20 years in educational technology. I did work with Yuri prior to working at K-12 Insight and was able to take a journey in a different perspective as we grew a company from 650,000 to 111 million. It was just absolutely a journey like I've never seen before. And at different stages, we we were able to grow and learn as the journey continued and as revenue continued, but Yuri came in at a really pivotal time to prepare the company for a mega merger that ended up happening. But we do have a long time journey and she has become a great friend and a thought partner. So I'm excited to not only be with you all today, but also have an opportunity to share a little of our story. Uh, I'd have to get hats off to CSM practice because bringing this kind of knowledge and sharing it amongst our network is so helpful as we're at different stages of growth in different areas of business and also different stages in our individual company. So I'm going to start with sharing a little bit about what we do, just because I do think it brings into perspective and growth wise where we are to kind of help you understand why we made some of the decisions that we made. As we think about reducing churn, of course, that's everybody's goal. We set our churn goals very early in our relationship with our companies. And I joined this company about a year and a half ago. And for six months, I asked the company to let me sit in and learn, not just learn about the company, but also learn the team. I think that was probably the wisest thing I have ever done. Because when you come into a new company and you have a long career with another company, a lot of the team wonders as a new leader, what you're going to come in and do and the changes you're going to make. And to make it exciting, I had to build trust, not only with our customers in order to reduce churn, but even more importantly, I had to build trust with my team to trust me to go along this journey with them because there were going to be some changes. If you don't trust your leader, I don't know that you get the final outcome that you want as a company, because I don't know that you're getting hundred percent from all of your employees. If you don't have that buy-in. So as we take this journey together, a little bit about what we do, we actually scored a customer experience, customer service software that we provide for superintendents and communication departments for K through 12. And even some cases we've added three colleges, educational system, all of the stakeholders, our parents, students, board members, and community members. We work with giant organizations to expand this knowledge of what is customer experience. And the K-12 industry didn't think that students and parents were customers. So we've been introducing not only the customer experience matters, but it builds trust in your community, especially after a year of a pandemic. We know we all experienced parents and students, the ones that were most apprehensive about believing what was next and what was coming next within our school systems. We partner with over 500 school districts. So I have the opportunity of serving not only our school district administrators, but also at the end of the day, students across the nation who want a voice and families. When I joined K-12 Insight, it was interesting. I sat with the CEO and of course the natural thing was came after a leader like me because of their goal to reduce churn. This team is that we had all these siloed departments and they all did wonderful things individually, but no right hand didn't always know what the left hand was doing. And so 
one of the first charges was break these silos down, whatever you can to do that. One of the strategies we used um, was to actually have the lead over the different departments. The other charge is that this company was growing at a really fast rate. Ultimately, scaling this company was one of the biggest challenges that our board and, and our CEO was concerned with. For me, and one of the things that I actually recommended is, you know, how confident is the team in what you do? I mean, we sell customer experience to the K-12 industry, but we ourselves have to have a high level of customer experience in order for them to buy into that. How confident was our team? And ultimately, that would directly, of course, affect our customers. Building strong relationship and trust with our customers also meant we needed to believe in what we did. They'd be great examples of what we did. So that was one of our challenges as well, to make sure that that was a piece of this puzzle that we actually really honed in on. And uh, we mastered. And then, of course, they needed a leader for this vision, not only their CEO, but they needed someone to come in who believed in the vision of this is where we were going in order to get the impact we wanted. Customer success really is about making customer feel successful. Initially, the vision that was shared in a discussion before I started, and ultimately, this is how it landed. So here were my challenges. I had an implementation team. I had a team of what they called SAE, strategic account executives. I had a sales team, I had a research team, a professional development team, and a technical support team. All of those teams rolled up to me except for the sales team, and there was no customer success team. So they would implement, and then from implementation, they talk about the contract and the renewal. It would go right to the SAE. We had teams working, of course, in individual silos. The implementation manager's like, I don't know, I implemented them, and they said it was a good implementation. And then the strategic account executive would come in and say, well, guess what? I went to get the renewal and they said implementation wasn't that great, but I did everything I could to do to get the renewals. And then understanding the value of the proper onboarding was this miscommunication of what implementation meant. I implemented them. They said they got it. I tried to renew them. There's an issue with the renewal. At the end of the day, we didn't have any of those answers at the beginning, but we knew these were problems we had to solve. Where was the miscommunication? Where were those gaps? And at the end of the day, the turn rate was still too high for the size of the company that we had. This is a seven-year-old product. It was growing by millions, not thousands. So this was something we had to almost stop and halt sales to fix. Because in order to scale a company growing this fast, you all know, if you don't fix this problem, you create a true mountain instead of the molehill as Time continues to run and customers are added. Lots of challenges. And you actually came in from an organization that had a huge customer success team. So this was pretty shocking for you. What, what are the first thing that you decided to do and to tackle this? 60 in my old company and none in the new company. And everybody had a piece of the client success responsibility, but they didn't have all of it. There's lots of points and being pointing of fingers. We did it a few ways. First of all, I had to reorg and they were like, okay, you're going to make us into what? Someone had never heard of what a CSM even was. Can you imagine starting there? I wasn't afraid of that challenge though, because sometimes when you get the opportunity to introduce a client success manager from the beginning, you can actually do it the right way. They don't come in with perceived notions, right? Of what a CSM does. And then you got to go in and fix some bad habits. Like that's not really what it is. I'm glad your old company worked that way. I didn't have to have those conversations. So I could start with really what it was and I educated them. And, and I did a lot of things. I didn't go in and teach. This isn't a classroom. I made them go and learn and come back and teach each other. And then I'd be there to encourage their presentations. And then also in the long run, train them to become CSMs without them even realizing that's what was happening. We helped them understand what a true customer journey map was. Do you realize that some of these team members had never even seen what the journey should look like? So how do you really run a race if you don't know the direction of the start and finish? We broke these down into special projects, which I actually created some slides to show you today. Some of the special projects we immediately gave our teams and they killed it. They were so intrigued and so interested on what we were talking about. And when we meant customer service from an educational technology standpoint, but even from a natural journey standpoint, setting that journey up from the customer, as, as most of you know, helps them even see their start to finish, see if they are reaching the goals that they consider to be successful. We also identify the ideal customer profile. Anybody knows in a startup, every customer is a perfect customer every customer. We're bringing in revenue. We're trying to keep investors happy, lights on, people paid, right? Let's just keep it very, very real. At the end of the day, creating that ideal customer profile 
allowed us to go out and seek the right customer, which of course, as you all know, helps you tremendously when it comes to retention because you find both sides get to happy really fast. We also optimize the sales process. I don't talk about it too much in this journey today because we're on the client success side, but ultimately ended up because of this new collaboration, the sales team now also reports to me in this organization. So I was just wondering, you mentioned that, that when you started in this role, you asked for kind of six months to be able to build trust and take your time. And, and I've always found that's really challenging because often when you start in a new role, they're like, we needed you three months ago and they expect change right away. So I was interested in how you negotiated that from the get go. You know, we negotiate a lot of things. We negotiate hopefully great salaries, great benefits. We negotiate great vacation, right? We're good at that as executives. But we need to be bold enough to go in and also negotiate an opportunity to succeed. My advice and recommendation to each one of you is that, especially in a new opportunity and a new job, they need you as much as you want to join and be a part of them. And I say that the learning that I was able to achieve in six months not only allowed me to get to know the team, but it gained a lot of respect from the team. A new leader coming in and just deciding that this is the new way to do it and they don't even know what the software does. Talk about losing respect from a team immediately. Believe me, you'll have three months of murmur anyway. So you might as well use three months to learn and let them know this is going to be a very slow approach to where we need to go. The other buy-in, if you're ever in a situation where you can negotiate that, is that the team thinks they're doing the growth with you and the change with you versus you coming in, laying down what feels like them, an ax and a hammer every other week. It is not easy, but if you have a company who really says they need you three months ago, they were already six months late before they got you. Convince them that it will be worth this journey together to allow you to come in, learn, join and be a part of a team. You'll have a buy-in that actually helps you make these changes a lot easier when they feel like we're making these changes because we all agree this is what's needed, what's next as you educate them. Be bold in it. And sometimes it may be three months, but in that I learned the software, I learned the people and their names. I knew they had kids. This one decided not to have kids and only wants dogs. I learned that some were really strong at implementation and some were great at renewals. In between, we created plans to fill those and solve for those gaps. And uh, I feel like the team themselves found it super important that I was investing in them as much as the company was investing in me. So what did you do? You talk about reorg. When did you do the reorg? Did it take you a few months? Yeah, I did it at the end of the six months after learning their strengths. And I found that what I thought were going to be my CSMs. I thought my implementation and SAE were going to merge together and be my new CSM team. That seemed like a natural puzzle and solution, right? Well, no, some of them were so good. They needed to be in sales. And in fact, the one I moved over that I knew should have been in sales is our highest performing sales leader, Judy. And she's our youngest sales team member too. And sometimes it wasn't wrong on all of my changes, but I prepared them that I might not be right on these calls. One thing I did tell them is you weren't gonna lose your job, but I'm gonna find the perfect place for you because everybody isn't cut out to be a CSM. Out of the CSM team between those implementation managers and strategic account executive, those SAEs that I thought would be my CSMs, to move to the sales team, the rest stayed on the client success. And we talk about your three-prong approach with three strategies. Maybe walk us through how did you move towards that new strategy of yours? Yeah, I looked at a couple things. In those six months, I came out with three good questions. And ultimately what you're kind of seeing is my wheel for my journey. Is this client gonna be good for us in the future? And the reason is, is because you think about the way we engage with our clients. A, we date them. Then we get engaged. Everybody gets excited. And you're a newlywed with them for a little while and you're all excited. You're doing all the fun dates. But what happens after that when you've been married for a little while? Those customers in our cases end up being the testimonials we share to get further business. They're the references. So if you start out with them being a good fit, you ultimately end up with a customer for life that continues to pour back into your business and pours right back into sales. I'm going to tell you 40% of our growth came from customers who were already with us. We invest in enough time to just not say every customer is a good customer. In the sales process, we're really thinking about the customer starting with us is one part and it brings in a lot of new revenue, but the customer that my CSM ends up with is going to actually be what catapults my sales a year from now. 
And so will this client be a good fit? Will they be with us long term and will they continue to grow with our product? How are they going to define value? How are they going to know that every year staying with me brings them some type of added value that they want to continue to benefit from? And then how am I going to maximize and maintain that value? And that's kind of how we looked at how can we gauge it from like a customer satisfaction standpoint? And how do we know when they're in trouble from an early warning? None of these things were built prior to me arriving. My name is Natasha and I work for an Ego platform that enables our customers to sell solar home systems. This industry has a range of customers, some who have just started and who don't really know what they are doing up to enterprise customers. So most of the smaller customers who can find us expensive and might not stay with us for long. So my question was, we target customers that we know are a good fit for our company because I feel the CSM who will end up having only the startups type of customer will have the highest chance. The industries are all a little bit different. In some cases in your situation, the smaller customers or customers that you are finding churn more frequently either is A, because they're not a good fit. The other time, you know, what we have found and where Irit helped me significantly is segmenting them out and their needs, creating a team that maybe doesn't need an employee that is a full-time CSM, but even maybe a junior CSM or works in a cohort with those segments that you are struggling with. You know, in some industries, in my old industry, there were customers that came in, we called them the smalls, never called them that to their face, of course. But we actually created a, a small team that managed the smalls a little bit differently than they managed our midsize and our large enterprise clients. And the reason was they just had different needs. They don't necessarily have to churn, but if we're a circle, we don't necessarily fit in a square box and vice versa. And so I think it really is about if you are going to continue to sell to those types of customers, you are going to have to invest in a team that can support them, that meets them where they are. Because it may either feel like an overkill and you may not get the same engagement with a customer that has that lower engagement. So you're going to need a strategy for them. We personally do not go after that customer at all. Uh, we do mid-size to enterprise only. And the reason is, is because AR software complements that very, very well. And then also, our customers really see the benefit in the third year. It doesn't benefit us to do the short-term customer at all. Walk us through. There's so all these the answers to the questions are really projects that you started setting up in order to address these questions. So you asked the questions. What did you do next? You know, I broke down by by capability. I shared a little bit of that with you all. I broke down. Really, what my team, what their capabilities were, and we set, if you look to the left, these little Harvey balls, it was so absolutely like enlightening to our team to see where they really were versus where they thought they were on training and onboarding, implementation and change management, performance management, risk assessment. They could tell you emotionally where these customers were. But when we really looked at it from a special project perspective, we broke it down into the client fit and readiness all the way down to that early warning that we just went through that little fun circle with you all. And then we created together the areas of improvement. Wow, after we learned about what we should be doing, here are our areas of improvement. And then we created an initiative to support those areas of improvement. Sometimes giving your team a picture of themselves. I didn't think I gained any weight in COVID. And so I saw a picture of before COVID and after COVID. And I thought, oh, I, we should not have baked as much as we did. So this is our version of like, give themselves where they are, their own report card, their own scorecard of kind of, hey, now that you've learned all of this over the six months and what we should be practicing, here are the areas we see for improvement. And we created the initiative together. Not that you were doing it all wrong. We don't take that approach, of course, but here's a way we can look at it from where we're focused, the areas we need to improve on, and then the initiative. This is our approach and it was super helpful. Client fit and readiness, basically this is the way it looked. We started with that ideal customer profile that we talked about, you know, that our school district was identified and what that qualified opportunity would look like. That client readiness, we ultimately created what we considered our version of client readiness. Are they prepared? Are they mentally, physically, and do they have the right team prepared to accept this relationship as a true partnership? We've had to say, you know what, we do want to get you started and implemented. But because you have a small team on your side, we need more champions. We need more help. So in order for us to sign off that you're ready to start this, truly do a kickoff call. We are going to need one or two more people on your side 
to commit to the work. I'm going to tell you that was a huge help. Where sales meets client readiness and handoff is the ideal customer profile is decided between now the sales team and the CSM, not just the sales team anymore. We actually even create an implementation plan at the sales level. We share it with the sales team or join their sales meeting. That way, when the client readiness piece comes, nobody's surprised that these are all the things we're expecting to happen even before we close when this deal. And once it's closed when and kickoff, you guys do this part right, that kickoff call will feel so different and their first stages of their journey will be absolutely night and day different from your old world of implementation. The change management part was really important. Helping a client know what's coming makes them so much better prepared to succeed. So if you think about it, if somebody tells you, hey, I'm going to give you a shot in your arm, which all of us have been receiving lots of shots in our arms probably lately. You brace yourself. You get ready for that there's going to be a little pain that comes, the little stick that comes with this shot. If they walked up to you and stuck it into your arm and you're shocked, that's what we're doing to our clients. We need to help them prepare for from pre-kickoff all the way out through their client journey and ongoing expansion, what's coming. When you do that, when you set the stage I'm going to tell you, you start setting in their mind the vision of success even before they experience it. And let's just say things don't go the way they planned. You set an expectation of what they should have experienced. So they'll come back to you and say, so what did I do wrong? We both had this goal. We both had this expectation. And you're right. When we didn't have enough people show up for the user training, that definitely affected. But as you're diagnosing, it does feel like you're a true partner. So this stage of change management, getting a client ready for what's to come, is hugely important, especially if your goal is to reduce churn. So we pop into the onboarding and training redesign. The reason we called it redesign is because we added milestones. We didn't have those before. These were milestones that both not only our team could envision, but also our customer. And this is the agreed upon success that we talked about. Just wanted to show you just a quick slide when we decided what our use cases were, how it affected each department cross-functionally, and then we were on the exact same page on what an ideal customer was for our company. And this was a great exercise. If I go into the last stage of this, it's how do I maximize and maintain that value? Capturing customer NPS and CSAT and that early warning system was just huge. Biggest challenge most of us have is like when to actually come in and do that litmus test on how people are doing. We kind of created this with the whole definition of the situation, the complication. If you guys have ever done that exercise, super awesome when it comes to like, what do we currently gather? When is the right time? And so this is what we drew off as far as timeline of when we wanted to check in and get a true understanding of how our customers were doing and how happy they were. At the end of the day, we're supposed to delight them. Our early warning dashboard kind of looked like this. This ultimately became the dashboard that we're working with Gainsight to actually automate. But this is how we drew it out at first. And it was so helpful as you start the Gainsight meetings to have this vision of what we considered our reasons for churn and why people leave and why people cancel. So just so you all know, this was a team design and an organizational thought exercise that we used from current clients who had left and also current clients we considered at risk. And we started identifying in two types of, if you look at the top of the timeline, that's an implementation health. And at the bottom of the timeline, you'll see this perception relationship and deal health. So this allowed us to bring sales and implementation into the same journey for our early warning dashboard. We actually have brought it into Salesforce and it gives us triggers of clients to watch or clients that could be at risk. I've never seen that type of chart before. So I think it's really interesting. If you can give us like one example of how this chart works, I think it would be very beneficial. Yeah. So when we looked at things like the path to value on the very top, a low client readiness score, we actually went in and created what we considered on our scale, you know, a one to five. And we had several questions behind the scenes that add up to this low client readiness score that allowed customers to either score a one through five and then ultimately fell into a category. And it took a lot of help from our business team, but ultimately we could figure out if they fell in between certain numbers, which ones were at risk and which ones scored really high as far as readiness. Ultimately, we did the exact same thing for the quality of implementation. 
if there's features in our product they use, they got a point. Let's just say if there's features they don't use, ones the higher points, of course, had higher implementation scores. But we kind of created in each one of those box our own version and value system that was aligned to our clients' performance and usage. Ultimately, we saw that the lower scores ended up in logo churn and then gross retention. The higher ones tended to soar right through and retain them at no problem. So our focus was if we increased everything in these top boxes that start with this magenta color all the way over to green, and we increased those scores, we saw the numbers immediately decrease and the client success manager knew where to focus if they scored out pretty low on those. I wanted to ask if this model was built on post-mortem analysis. Did you check with the customers that already churned and based on that build early warning system? No, it was absolutely. Our post-mortem analysis is what created this. And it did take me six months to learn what that was. Still didn't have a huge amount of churn, but learning the customers that did leave or were at risk, and I was trying to help save from the very beginning, really did help us create this early warning dashboard. Once we did that post-mortem analysis, we ultimately realized that low wallet and low share, and you've got these small clients and you give all the same energy to them, but you've got these really big clients. You know, we have clients that are over a half million dollars a year and how we treat them and how we weight them was really important. CSMs don't know where to focus. They take everything you teach them and then they go and give the same energy. Segmentation was huge. And on the left, you'll see how we segmented them out. On the right though, we wanted to make sure that when we think about optimizing a client, right? The client optimization rubric or core was that number system that we created for value, right? Internally, but you'll see on the right, this is where we landed that the quality of implementation and the customer satisfaction, which are all the things we're focused on were equally as important. And when we put those two together and we have the right segments using the right approach, highly successful. I was able to take what I learned in six months and look at their entire year. I watched this literally on a day-to-day -day basis. You're seeing on a month-to-month -month basis so I can see how we're performing against last year. Year-to-date, we're at 1.5% churn on our Engage platform, which is our survey platform, and 1.4% churn on our Let's Talk. And we need to look at, and this is probably the model you guys see at the end result for your current companies, but just something to, to motivate your team. You talk about team motivator, you know, they were at more like 8% turn. We're on track right now. We're hoping to do 8% all year instead of 16. And um, it could even be lower how we turned out, but we do forecast it, see how we're doing. And I just want you to see how we kind of break things down. We have healthy, we have the ones we've won, the clients that are renewed. We have not healthy, which does mean they're not yet at risk, but their core scores are pretty low based on our early warning. So we give them a little bit extra tension and love. We focus in on, you know, anywhere those points are deficit, uh, we go after them. We also publish every month in our business meeting, the clients we've lost. We also share in an all hands every month on a separate meeting, all the strategies we use to keep them so that we can start staying ahead of what went wrong with the clients that we did lose. The turn right now is on track to 8% or less in 12 months as we start from January to December. Our sales, marketing, and our client success team are all now working together instead of basically working individually in these silos. The upsell revenue, you know, that's one piece that we talked about from the very beginning and we actually showcased to you, and I didn't have a lot of slides, but I do want to tell you the upsell and the cross-sell happened naturally when we started really giving a lot of extra attention and love during those, you know, revelation of that early warning, like there's some risk here. We started giving love. Not only did they stay, they didn't even realize we had some tools or some products or services they could buy because we were so heavily engaged. So this has been happening naturally. I did not have to fire any of these team members. You know, every single one of them has found where their skill sets really align to and they are soaring. I want to say I have the highest performing team across the board than the company has seen in the seven years of the Let's Talk product and the 20 years of our Engage product. We also really went through an exercise after learning the clients and learning the team. It wasn't just a matter of who was a CSM and who should be on sales or who should be in product. It was about, and are you the right fit? Are you the best one to manage these type of customers? We really looked at their skill sets and we kind of played a little dating game and made sure we matched the right talent with the right customer and our customer engagements off the chain. I'm in New Orleans. I'm presenting at a conference here 
And we went out and got beignets for all of our current customers and said, meet us at a booth and don't stand in line. And I think I heard more about support than I have heard since I've been here. Thank you yes. so much. Amazing presentation. I'm really thoroughly impressed with the fact that you didn't even have to fire anybody. You just repurposed them. I think it showcases a lot about you as a leader in the team. We do have a few more questions. Brooke asked, I'm starting a new CSM organization at a company that has been around for five years. Our biggest challenge is with churn with long-term customers who won't engage with the CSMs. Any advice in how to gain a foothold with the long-term clients who won't engage with them? We all have them. You're not alone, that's for sure. But we've done just slight of stalking these poor people. We showed up. We showed up at their door. Sometimes we have found from the experience here at K-12 Insight, there's a lot of cocky customers too. They don't believe they need you. Like I've been using your product longer than you've been a CSM. We also did a really cool exercise where we went in and found other champions, found other people in departments that we kind of sold and upsold other products to who were like, wow, you know, Jane, we never knew that we could do this with K-12 Insight. You never shared that with us. And I think they start opening up a little, but that's a hard one. Ultimately, if you end up losing a customer that's been with you for a long time, that churn was probably years coming. It just didn't happen. If you do recognize through an early warning system like we've created, ultimately, I would start breaking apart into pieces the way we did. You know, is it usage? Is it engagement? Is it that they don't return your calls? We go straight to our superintendents and we create reviews and updates for them that maybe sometimes bring in at a higher level or a larger our districts. Don't be afraid to be ruthless. Let them know how important they are to you and that you don't want them to miss out an opportunity to not only have the continued value that you offer, but not only to miss out. My CEO always says they're getting 10% on the dollar. Tell them that. Dollars speak a lot. It goes a long way. So I'd like for you to get 90% on the dollar or 100% on the dollar, right? So let me come in and help you. Don't give up. You know, you stay diligent. And, and a few of them, I hate to say it, but they're not going to be your customers in the future. But we did find the most awesome client success leader as our VP of client success. And she is ruthless. She reaches out on LinkedIn. She shares all kinds of fun comments, stories, examples, testimonials, case studies with their entire department. So be ruthless. Hey, they were going to lose anyway. You have nothing to lose if they were going to leave. Were you able to regain a lost customer with this approach? Like question. Usually, I find that with exit interviews, you get a lot of material where you realize that you have made some mistakes or the organization made some mistakes, but it's too late in the game, but maybe apply that approach and regain their trust. Were you able to do so with this approach and how? Yes, that ruthless approach that I shared that our uh, VP of client success, you, she saved with K-12 Insight. We've never went back and saved two exit interviews. In fact, I had dinner with the client she saved last night here in New Orleans. And you're absolutely right. The value there is huge, that exit interview. And it was able to give her a conversation that she just never had with our organization. And we eventually talked and eventually they gave us another chance. For me, ghost clients are, are existing. We're not going to ever get rid of them. They are here and they're here to stay because we are human. This is how we act. But if they're ghosting only on the CSM, then it means the CSM needs to work really harder to explain the client what the value they bring to them, to the clients, instead of for the company. And if they understand the value there, you will see the shift coming from the account executive moving to the CSM when they need something which is not sales, which is features, support, and everything else. So there's a little bit of a work I'm coming from the services company. So we don't sell product, we sell services. All I see is based on SaaS client success. There's not even a lot of talking about services. And in SaaS, you have a feature, you have a product, and this feature is not changing. The use case changed, the value yeah. changed, the need changed. But the feature is a feature, it stays as it is. While in services, it depends much more on the people capacity and capabilities and chemistry between the one who gives the service and the one who receives the service and it can change all the time. It is the CSM world planning to go a little bit broader of the SaaS environment into the services? 100%. I have a lot of clients that are in services or that they sell technology, but really most of the revenues are coming from projects or customization projects rather that they do for clients. And we have uh, multiple clients that don't even sell technology. They only sell services. And what you want to focus on there is, are they using all the services that you have? 
Because if your company is built in an optimized way, you should have some sort of an upsell strategy. Are they renewing with you? Or when they're done with the project, are they willing to do other projects with you? So that's another litmus test for that. And yes, of course, you want to gauge for empathy and connection and chemistry. But at the end of the day, you want to ask yourself the hard question, are we delivering to scope? Or are we also emphasizing business outcomes? Are we even keeping a list of the business outcomes that we have achieved or just a list of did we deliver on scope? And this is actually very important for everyone on the call today, because even though everyone, most of you are selling technology, there is a plethora of services that you should be considering selling or you are delivering for free. Are your customers getting a holistic value not just from your technology, but as a partnership to your company. And I think that's a very good point, Roy, that a lot of companies just don't put a lot of emphasis on the holistic value that they're getting out of the partnership with your company. They're just focusing on, did you use this feature or that feature, which I think is a big, big mistake. So thank you for that question. Thank you so much for today, Krista. Absolutely fantastic work. Really appreciate you sharing all your insights. Any last advice? Yeah, I think that the most important thing to take away is that we all have different companies. We are all in different types of businesses. I think the most important thing I would say is invest in your people. There's no bigger investment that you will get and no bigger cause of growth. I wish I could tell you like, oh, designed all this and then it worked. I could not have done it without a stellar team. And recognizing someone's talent is the biggest compliment you could ever give them. And when you highlight how good someone is and you compliment their skills, you will see an employee take that to a whole nother level. For me to have no CSMs when I started and probably the best CSMs in the business right now is a testament to just being able to recognize who they were and how good they were. So I would just give a shout out to your teams Keep, and, and then stay encouraged that one size does it all. We're all at different places, but taking a piece of everything I've learned at every level of business in my 20 years is really what created what you saw today. Well, thank you so much, everyone.